Hi everybody, welcome to another episode of Historia Politica Publica. This will be the last episode about Harry Potter and their analogies with the Cold War. In the other two episodes I have analyzed the first six books and also delved into the slavery that the elves are forced upon them. Also the characterization of the Muggles as, uh, as something clearly distinct from the wizards and also how they are portrayed in a kind of paternalistic view, uh, view such as inferior people and so on. The, it is not said explicitly that they are like uh, less than the wizard, only just by Voldemort and uh, his allies. But even those that we could consider as good wizards, uh, they do not want to integrate too much with the a uh, Muggles. And even Arthur Wesley, which is the character who uh, surely had more interest in engaging with the Muggles, he's doing it more in a kind of curious way, uh, like a person who has discovered something interesting in the world uh, and is amazed about that rather but from the point of a uh, human view, I, I, I will say, because Arthur Wesley is a fascinated by the invention of the Muggles, which is uh, interesting to read. And at the same time, it doesn't seem that he wants to spend a day with Muggles just in order to see how they relate between them, how they express their culture, their history, and other kind of aspects. So. Just to recapitulate before going to the seventh book and the analogy with the Cold War, uh, the first book, uh, The Sorcerer's Stone, it was a, an analogy for the truth ideology that was pursued during the Cold War, which was the real ideology, communism and capitalism, and because the Sorcerer's Stone at the end of the book is destroyed, this seems that uh, we were not able to identify which one of those two blocks in the uh, Cold War was the right one. Although this could be debated later because with the collapse of the Soviet Union it could be said that at the end it is capitalism that consolidated uh, as the hegemonic power. Um, in that sense it will be a, a, another episode to kind of do a counterfactual debate. In the second book I spoke how the Chamber of Secrets it was an analogy between the spies of the Soviet Union in the USA and uh, in the opposite side, also how the Western world tried to uh, infiltrate in, in the Eastern Bloc and this was part of the Battle of Ideas. The third book, The Prisoner of Azkaban, is an analogy of the colonized world, how those people who were in prison under the yoke of the British Empire or the French Empire. Uh, they were forced to fight for their liberation and once they had access to technologies to group together through the use of the media, as was perfectly illustrated in uh, Algeria, how this was a clear reference by the newspaper that Sirius Black read in order to escape the the prison because he realized then that it is uh, Peter Pettigrew which is living among the Wesley family who at the same time is going to Hogwarts, the Goblet of Fire, the fourth book of Harry Potter. This is a, a reference to the race to the space, the Trigus are tournament. We have a Harry Potter, we have Cedric Diggory, both represents the Western world. Cedric Diggory, England, and Harry Potter, USA, whereas Victor Krum, who came from Bulgaria, the Eastern Bloc at the Cold War, represents the Soviet Union. And there is this race to compete for the a uh, going to the moon. In, in the real world, it was Yuri Gagarin, the Soviet uh, astronaut, the first person who went to outer space. Whether it's here in the book, it is Cedric and Harry Potter who both together uh, touch the cup and at the same time make an, an analogy of the alliance between the US and the UK. And as I told in the last episode, this Flore de la Coke, a character which is not delved into her too much, the French uh, people from Box Bottles, the Wizard School, they are a portray as a kind of beauty, something which are beyond the world. Something like exotic, not they don't really explore 
about their characters and so on, all the flavors de la cour, uh, in the last books with their relation with Bill Weasley, the brother of Ron, uh, she takes a more important role in the story. The Order of Phoenix, the fifth book, it is a reference to the non aligned movement. These people who did not want to ally with the Ministry of Magic because they are basically telling lies about everything that is happening um, the USA, for example. And neither the other side, which is uh, Voldemort and their allies, which are trying to convince uh, people to ally with themselves and so on. This could be the Soviet Union. And in the middle, there is the non ally movement, those group of nations who uh, organized the Bandung Conference in 1955, like uh, in order to not, not uh, relate themselves with either communism and capitalism, they wanted a, a third way. And you had their representatives from India, from Ghana, from Indonesia, Yugoslavia, and many other countries. Finally, the Half-Blood Prince, I uh, argue that it was a reference to Peter Kropotkin, one of the uh, most important intellectuals of anarchism, even though he died before the Cold War, uh, he died in 1921. I think it is important because uh, his legacy continued on later on, same as a Severus Snape that even though he died uh, years later, uh, he the, the, the son of Ginny Weasley and Harry Potter has his name in it. Uh, he's remembered as the most brave uh, director in the history of war because he was able to kind of uh, distance himself from both sides from Lord Voldemort and Dumbledore's side he didn't want to uh, really support uh, Howard uh, apart from the fact that he loved uh, Lily Potter Lily James sorry the father of Harry Potter the mother and in that sense he same as Peter Kropotkin, whose idea was to create a, bit, a better world and criticize at the same time both the uh, imperialism portrayed by the Western countries, the USA, England, France, Germany, and so on. He did like either this idea of state socialism that he was seeing during those years, and in fact, when he came back to Russia in 1917 after the October Revolution, he started to witness the uh, the kind of Bolshevist movement, and even though at the beginning he was sympathetic to it, uh, during the next year he was disappointed. He has he had discussions with Lenin, and he declared himself that anarchism would mean another different thing. And, and in that sense, same as Severus Snape, he wanted just to create a just world in the idea. <laughs> preconceived by himself. So in, in in that sense, let's say that Kropotkin died in 1921 when he uh, died because he was all I, I think he was almost 80. He was buried in the Soviet Union and even though the anarchists uh, the anarchists and the communists were having many fights by, back then the communists uh, the Red Army had crossed the Magno Vista in Ukraine, the anarchist experiment lay by, by Nextor Magno and the other peasants. Still, Lenin uh, concede that Kropotkin deserved a great burial and many people were there. I mean, the, the statistics say that between 20,000 people and 100,000 people went to see Kropotkin uh, burial. It is also said that from one in one mile radius, you could just see people. Uh, so apparently, even though the statistics are very varied, the thing is that there were thousands of people there. Many were paying homage to Kropotkin, but also to criticizing the Soviet Union for its uh, totalitarian kind of approach. And the thing is, like others were proclaiming the need for anarchism and so on. So in other words, the burial of Kropotkin was a kind of epitome of the ideas of anarchism and how those could be um, expanded across society. So what a better place to do that, that in the uh, Russia that was very close to to be formed into the Soviet Union, something that will happen the next year. But at that time, the civil war was finished and also there were four years after the Russian Revolution. In that sense, Alan Rickman, the actor who interpreted a 
Severus Snape, when he died in 2016, there were homage to him in many countries of the world. There was in the US, there was in England, and also many others, but they all share a common idea, which was like putting their, their wands upon the sky while saying the word always. Always is perhaps the most important sentence that Severus Snape has always said in the book and which epitomized all his idea that he will always love Lily James, the mother of Harry Potter. And at the same time, this will mean that he will always be on the side of trying to protect the son of Lily James because he knows that Lily died because she was protecting Harry Potter. So for him, it is uh, his aim to pursue this idea of protecting the kid, even though he doesn't like Harry Potter and he's very clear about that. But he wants to proceed with this. Same as anarchism, you don't need to like every people to want the best for all of them. And Severus Snape epitomized perfectly this kind of anarchist idea. So with that, when Anna Alan Rickman died in 2016, there was a huge uh, movement around the world, same as when Kropotkin died in, in Russia. So this kind of figure, all the ideas that has been created uh, behind them, how in the case of Alan Rickman, a character like Severus Snape g gave him some, so much legitimacy among the world, even though he has always been a great actor in in England and very, very famous, like for movies like Love Actually, Sweeney Tooth, also a lot of uh, performance in theater. But it was Harry Potter, perhaps, and Severus Snape in particular, uh, the, probably the most interesting character in all the saga, alongside Sirius Black, Sirius Black, I will say, those two characters uh, who, even though they hate each other in the in the story, at the end they, they pursue the, the same goal, um, which is protecting Harry Potter, uh, which epitomizes all the fight against the evil. And in that sense, and, but at the same time, both Snape and Sirius Black are outcasts of the system, which this is very important. When they die, they the other people believe that they were traitors, that they were evil, and so on. In the case of Sirius Black, it is the system who believe that, the whole society, who still considers Sirius Black as a murderer. Whereas in the case of Severus Snape, it is like uh, every everyone that believes that he betrayed Dumbledore, and it is not until he reveals the truth to Harry Potter with uh, the his, his thought, providing him with his thought, uh, that a he is able to redeem himself under the eyes of uh, the other. So in other words, Sirius Black and Severus Snape both represent uh, those ideas of fighting without looking for kind of reward, just because what they are doing, they believe that it is good in itself and they don't need to kind of explain or describe their motives. Um, and in that sense, both of them are one of two of the characters who suffer more during the history and we as readers may believe that their uh, causes are just and they are truly uh, they are unfairly treated by the whole society so finishing with the deadly hallows the last book i consider that this is a clear reference to the student revolts that happened in the 1960s and especially within the French May in 1968. This is important because in 1960s, uh, as the first, there was the first generation of students who could go in mass to the university after the Second World War. The creation of the welfare state in Europe provided with a free health uh, system, free education for the people, especially in Western Europe. And in that sense, in UK, in France, in Italy, in Germany, the number of people who could go to university increased in thousands of people. That created an intellectual hub within a, the same building, which outbores in revolt later on because the students believed that the education system was quite obsolete and they were demanding more freedom, more participatory democracy within the room, and this was extrapolated to outside of the society. In the case of France, it was specifically uh, powerful because Charles de Gaulle had ach uh, achieved the power in 1958, created the Fifth Republic, and this Fifth Republic was much more authoritarian than the Fourth Republic. The executive had 
an increase of power, which is, was a condition that Charles de Gaulle uh, demanded in order to come back to power. And in that regard, uh, the student revolt that happened also in Mexico, in the United States, it was very powerful in Berkeley, in countries like Egypt, in Czechoslovakia, uh, in 1968, in the Eastern Bloc. And in, in the case of uh, Harry Potter, it's important how in the Deathly Hallows, the last book, the students in general have a great role to defend the castle. The castle, which is Hogwarts, which is the school, which in the real world is the university. The students over the world were defending the institution and wanted to create a new system uh, and that the education will advance in the same way as the society. So in that sense, university was the hub in which everybody met and it was important to defend the university. So in if we already told that in the order of the Phoenix, uh, the students create the army of Dumbledore here in the Deadly Hallows, when the army of Voldemort want to attack the castle of Hogwarts, these the students that defend it. With the help of the professors, obviously McGonagall, uh, who else is there? Um, well, uh, Fleetwick, you have also uh, Hooch. I mean, all, all the, the professors of Howard had a paramount role in defending the castle, and even the adults from the Order of the Phoenix, like Nymphadora Tongues, you have Remus Lupin. The brothers Wesley, that had, uh, Fred and George, the twins, which at that time they are not students anymore. You have the family, the whole family of the Wesley, um, and there is many people joining together to defend the castle. Uh, we have in the real world people like Harry Marcuse, which was considered as the mentor of the French maid and the students revolt in the United States and many others, and he was a professor at that time. And he was supporting the students, so we can see how McGonagall, which is the person who is leading the defense of the castle, it is clear that figure of uh, a person who can provide inspiration because she has a deep knowledge, also she has a great experience about uh, defending herself and the magic community. And same as Marcuse, who had to flee Germany against the threat of Nazism and had all his life theorizing about how fascism came to power in many countries in the world. And in that sense, McGonagall, it is the clear analogy of Herbert Marcuse, in my opinion. At the same time, to defend the castle, they need the help of the professors, the people of the Order of the Phoenix, the students, and even from the gargoyles and the figures which are in the castle. These kind of stone-like figures that are warriors, are also kind of animals which are being awakened by McGonagall and other wizards to defend Hogwarts. This is very important because I believe that these figures represent the working class, which in France were awakened by the spark ignited by the students in French May. And they had a fundamental role to defeat the army of Lord Voldemort. Henceforth, we have here uh, how McGonagall with the spell uh, bring back to life these people, and in the French May, it was the students which, through their demands, through their movement, gave the empower the working class. Which at the end they had the uh, the chance, and they did to paralyze the whole country. They called for the general strike, and the statistics say that there were 10 million people in the streets on the streets in French May 1968. So. There were uh, kind of companies like the Renault of the cars, other industries which were paralyzed and Charles de Gaulle had to uh, flee the country and went to West Germany and was preparing. Uh, and I don't know if this has been confirmed, but he was talking with the army in order that the things could get complicated. But at the end, it was the, the Communist Party which uh, negotiate with Charles de Gaulle in order to stop the strikes. The Communist Party at that time in France was incredibly powerful. 
they had still the legitimacy of having defeated Nazi Germany because many of the people who fought in the resistance they were from the Communist Party. Most of them were from there and also from the uh, anarchist movement and socialism and so on. And the thing is like they have the power to call for the general strike. Um, so when the Communist Party decided uh, against the wishes of the students to stop the general strike and have some concessions from the goal and the French government, the general strike uh, lost its momentum and everything came back to normality. The students never uh, pardoned, never forgave the Communist Party for doing that. It was considered as a kind of treacherous by, by them. And at the same time, the Communist Party considered that the students were just kind of middle class bourgeois student, uh, people who did not have real demands, like material demands, like uh, they didn't need food or other kind of advances in society, and that they were just playing the, the game of being a revolutionary. So we see here the debate between the different groups. However, in Harry Potter, this does not happen because even Hagrid is able to bring the giants to help them against the army of Lord Voldemort. And precisely this is important because for Hagrid it was not easy to convince them. And if I am not wrong, I think there are some giants that still fight for Voldemort. But we see here how a to defend in Hogwarts, the university, the school, it is fundamental the relation between different forces in the case of Hogwarts, even different races who are fighting to save the castle. In the case of the real world, in French made different people from different classes background to defend uh, a society. And just to finish with the chapter of Harry Potter, I wanted to touch a bit uh, just some of the other topics I spoke about the slavery that are facing the elf, the systematic kind of paternalistic view to the muggles, but also the fact that the Slytherin people are the outcasts in the system. Those that Marcuse call uh, who had the power to lead the revolution, like people who were the most oppressed in society, Marcuse mentions women, black people, ethnic communities, and so on. Here in Howard, it's interesting how the Slytherin a house it is always portrayed as the evil one uh, and even in the in the seventh book once they have to defend the castle they are being uh, captive in the in the dungeons which is the place where a Slytherin house is based and they are not even able to participate and this is crazy because uh, I don't remember exactly in the book but in the movie it is that when Harry Potter appears in the castle one person of a Slytherin um, Pansy Parkinson, I think is her name, call everybody to capture Harry Potter and give him to Lord Voldemort. And just for that reason, everybody of Slytherin is punished to be in prison in the dungeons, which is crazy if you think so. I mean, it is true that in the story of Harry Potter, they always say that there were many people from Slytherin that they were supporting Lord Voldemort, and the examples are obviously Lucius Malfoy, the father of Draco Malfoy, the fathers of Crave and Goyle, which are the best friend of Malfoy. But apart from that, I don't think there is any more. And at the same time, it's like, okay, but let's say that, suppose that everybody in Slytherin were traitors. Obviously, they would deserve to be punished. There is hardly a discussion about that. Whether the nature of the punishment, that will be something to be debated. But the thing is like, if every year in Slytherin, there are seven seven different courses from year one to year seven. And let's say that in each course, there are like 20 people. So this, let's say that there are 150 Slytherin pupils every year in Howard's. So if everybody of them were traitors, then Howard's will be, or Dumbledore or the person who decides who came there, will be naive to accommodate them in the castle. And at the same time, if, all, if from all the 150, just five people, are sons or daughter of these eaters, the allies of Voldemort, then it would be completely unfair to punish all, all together, right? Like a kind of cutting the, the virus from the beginning, but I mean, and you, you just will need to assume that everybody would be friend of, of Malfoy, that probably this is not the case, because if Malfoy is in, let's say, sixth year, in the year six, and there are people in the second year, 
surely they will not i mean probably they will know him but they will no, they will never speak with him or something like that. So, in my opinion, the treatment of the Slytherin students is completely unfair. Nobody seems to do anything. And in fact, it is not just the fact that they are always leave us living left uh, outside, that they are in prison in the seventh book, but also during the whole story, it's like in the first book, they are going to win the the Cup of Hogwarts, uh, the, the House Cup. Um, but at the end is Dumbledore starts to give points to the people in Gryffindor like Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Hermione Granger and Neville Longbottom which is like obviously very exhilarating and it's amazing that this happened in the book because especially Neville Longbottom is the person who give uh, the victory to Gryffindor for his bravery to fight in his friends and I think this is a very powerful point when Dumbledore says like it is you need to be very brave to fight your enemies but you need to be even braver to fight your friends which is precisely what uh, with the Will Dumbledore does in the Sorcerer's Stone against Ron Weasley and Harry Potter. However, at the end no, nobody cares that Slytherin loses the house, the house cap even though they were by far the house with more points and we need to wonder why they were so far ahead the others one of the explanations is that snape is true that start to take out points to a gryffindor and perhaps dumbledore knew knew in that knowing that he wants to take uh, his revenge at the end but at the same time it, it is probably as it has some merit to be so far away so far away from gryffindor in the total scoreboard right Anyway, um, because the Slytherin are portrayed as, uh, I mean, because the symbol of Slytherin is a snake, they are based in the dungeons, the description of the people who goes to the house of Slytherin, it is that they are cunning, they are astute, in that sense, th those are characteristics that in, in themselves they are, they are good, I think, people who are able to think fast, in difficult situations and that are able to use their own intelligence in order to um, improve in their life but the way that it is expressed in Harry Potter world obviously those a uh, kind of qualities relating with the fact that many people in Slytherin in the past allied themselves with Lord Voldemort and the fact precisely that it was Tom Riddle which later became Lord Voldemort who was in the Slytherin house became the evils in the world, those kind of characteristics are related with the dark arts, the, the, the evil evilness. So where Ravenclaw, it, they are intelligent in a kind of other different way, the kind of they are clever and so on, the people in Slytherin, they are cunning, they are astute and here we, we see the money case world implemented in Harry Potter. And precisely this Lucius Malfoy which uh, has Dobby the Elf as the slave, and he's portrayed as evil, mistreating Dobby, but he's not the only wizard who has a slave, but he's the only that we see how he's mistreating uh, Dobby. So who is more evil, Lucius Malfoy? Because he's doing something within the system, same as the other wizards, normalizing a kind of attitude which obviously is exploiting the elves, or people like Dumbledore who having the power to change the system, having the kind of a legitimacy up upon the magic community in order to free the slave or at least to create a moment to try to do so same as Hermione does in Howard and fail to do so. Um, this is clear but obviously J.K. Rowling is smart about that and she never, she never tell us that Dumbledore is completely pure and in fact uh, there are many aspects of Dumbledore that they are blurry and it shows the contradict image of this wizard. And just to finish, and not, now I just remember, I wanted to speak a bit about Luna Lovewood, which is this character of Ravenclaw, um, who represents the kindness of the world, appears in the fifth movie and join the uh, army of Dumbledore and become one of the best friends of Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, Neville Longbottom, uh, Ginny Weasley and Hermione Granger. This person is portrayed as a kind of weird as a kind of something out of the world uh, he sees obviously 
uh, taking care of all the animals, of the beast, uh, and in the real world, uh, it's in interesting that uh, Evanna Lynch, the actor, she's vegan and she's very active in the public sphere. She's always writing and going to protest to protect the animal rights. And I think the character Luna Lovewood uh, depicts very well the life of the actress uh, in the real world. And Luna Lovewood, precisely, is one of the only people who believe Harry Potter, and this is very interesting because in the fifth book there is, as I mentioned, this whole atmosphere that Harry Potter and Dumbledore ha have lied about the resurrection of Lord Voldemort, but Luna Lovewood and his father, they both believe him. And they are considered as outcasts of the system, they are considered as weird, both his father is called Xenophilius Lovewood and Luna Lovewood. The people, uh, they make fun of her, they hide her clothes in the castle and so on. And she's one of those, the only people who really believe Harry Potter, even though she doesn't know him, which is interesting. And this shows that she's one of the most clever characters in the whole uh, saga of Harry Potter. And I think it's one of the most important characters, one of the most interesting to, to understand. She's weird. Why is she weird? Because she thinks differently uh, to the system. She's kind of a... This philosopher existentialist like Simone de Beauvoir who created, uh, wrote the book The Second Sex and it was quite criticized because, for, um, because it was a kind of a claim to proclaim equality between men and women and she was considered as a kind of radical feminist, a kind of weird and so on and in that sense it received widely criticized for the patriarchal masculine community and Luna Lovewood, which as I mentioned in the first episode, Ravenclaw represents French people because it's the house of the clever people and in the, in the, during the Cold War, all most of the intellectuals were from France. You have Foucault, Simone de Beauvoir, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, uh, Deleuze, you have Watery and a, a, probably I am forgetting somebody, but there were a lot of them, who many of them even took part in the resistance against uh, fascism, same as Luna Lovewood, which represents Simone de Beauvoir, uh, who she, she fought in the army of Dumbledore in the Ministry of Magic, and also to defend Howard. So, both she fight in the Ministry of Magic against the evil, and also to tell the truth to the whole world, to avoid the lies that there were being implemented by the media, and also at the end to defend the university. So Luna Lovewood fights for freedom, fights for education, fights, fights for the truth, and especially for the love, the love of people which have to be the kind of energy in which people must uh, live in harmony among themselves and to change the system. Same, same as Lily James, the mother of Harry Potter, with her love for his son was able to defeat Voldemort, Luna Lovewood, um, and here I will finish, is this character who is weird, is considered as different, and it is because she's against the system, because she can't see beyond what is being said by the media all the time. She doesn't care that much what the other things, because she knows that her, her struggle is genuine, she loves her friends, she's always able to help, and this is the person, the kind of people which are fundamental to create a new world. So, Luna Lovewood, which even her name obviously has a reference of love good, uh, and Luna like the moon. In that sense, all her, the character of her, which appears in the fifth movie, in the fifth book, uh, it will be fundamental to understand the whole world of Harry Potter and to give us some optimism that at the end, or at least in some years, the Slytherin house and the, uh, the elves will be finally liberated from the oppression that they are being faced in the whole saga.